Hey guys, so this video is going to go on our learning Japanese playlist. So as some of you guys already know, I try to avoid talking about myself as much as possible unless it is relevant to our topic which is Japan. So over the years there have been a few people who've asked how I've how I learned Japanese and I haven't answered it just because I don't like talking about myself but I can see I can see that it is relevant to some people because people are interested in the different different ways that you can go about learning the language you know so and and what that means to when you live here so I can see the relevance so of course it depends on the person I know a guy I went to school with who finished school and went to university and studied linguistics at university and and learnt Chinese for four years and then went and lived in China for 10 years and I've met people in Japan who, who had the same sort of experience and I know some of our viewers have, have the same experience that they they studied Japanese in the home country first and then they came and, and lived in Japan and they could already uh, read and write and speak Japanese so uh, it depends on you know a lot on a lot of things of course on your background on your experience on on your motivations, on all sorts of stuff, of course. So, in my particular case, what happened was, uh, I was doing martial arts in Australia, and I wasn't really interested in Japan. I was interested in Japanese martial arts, but I wasn't really interested in Japan itself. And a friend of mine was living here, and uh, who did the same martial arts, he did Aikido. And uh, he kept saying to me, come visit, come visit, you're gonna love it, you're gonna love it. And I, was, I just wasn't interested. The images I had in my head in Japan, all those sort of Tokyo images and it just didn't appeal to me at all you know so I just wasn't interested and he kept asking and kept asking and then an opportunity presented itself I had some time off work and uh, he invited me again and I all right okay I'm coming so I came here expecting just to be here for a short time and then go home and forget all about it and I just loved the place from the moment I arrived you know so that first visit, my Japanese was virtually zero. I mean, they use some pretty average Japanese in the in the dojo in Australia, but it's pretty bad, you know. Um, and it was just martial arts stuff, you know. So as far as actually communicating with anybody here, it was virtually zero. Um, and I stayed here and visited him, and then I went back to Australia, and I, I couldn't wait to get back here again. So I, I did actually come back here again for another visit, and I went back there again. And then my my job changed in in Australia, and, and and I had a period of, after, well, after I stopped work, I hadn't had any holidays for a really long time. So I had some free time. So I came over again and the, the plan was that time, because the job had finished, I had some free time that was owing to me because I hadn't had any time off for a long time. And the plan was just to come here and just to be here for a short time and you know do some martial arts and things and then go back to Australia and start a new, new career or a new job, you know? And so, again, I came here with the intention of just being here a short time and then going back. So I was sort of picking up some Japanese, but I wasn't really, really into it, you know, because it it's seems like such a huge thing to learn a language that just learning some basics just to sort of be polite and things like that seems to be enough for the short time that I was supposed to be here. And one thing led to another, <laughs> and I'm still here. So uh, it wasn't the plan, it wasn't the plan to stay here. And in fact, you know, my family had said to me, you know, you're not gonna stay there and marry a Japanese lady, are you? And, no, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just be here for a little while, then I'll come back to Australia and I'll start a new career. I was actually gonna start a new career in Australia as a flying instructor, that was the plan. Um, and I had a commercial, oh, I have, I have a, an Australian commercial pilot's license and the plan was to become a flying instructor in Australia, that was the plan. And then just couldn't leave this place just couldn't leave it it was just too good so um, zero zero Japanese at that stage couldn't read it couldn't read anything couldn't speak anything couldn't understand anything it was all just a mystery um, so I, I was watching a lot of TV I had a little dictionary um, Japanese to English dictionary English to Japanese dictionary um, just on that too if you have a little dictionary it won't have enough words in it right um, a proper dictionary, I mean these days everybody has electronic ones, right? That, that's the key, that's the key. But in those days, in those days it was a little paper dictionary and half of it was English to Japanese, half was Japanese to English. And it's it's sort of helpful, I mean, I'd plan, you know, if I was going to go somewhere, I was going to go into Nagoya or go somewhere, 
I'd, I'd sit there with the book and look it up, you know, and, and Sumi my sen, Sumi my sen, uh, Nagoya ni hiki tai desu kero. Um, no, that's not what I would have said, but something along those lines with equally bad pronunciation. Um, and I'd prepare, I'd prepare what I was going to say at the station because I couldn't read anything, I didn't know anything. Um, interestingly, or maybe not interestingly, but by the by the way, uh, in Australia, I'd never caught a train, right? <laughs> Just because of where I lived, the trains weren't a thing, you know? So I'd never caught a train. So the first time I actually caught a train was in Japan and I couldn't read anything. I had to ask the station guy, you know, how much was the ticket and, and he helped me get the ticket and then I had to ask which platform it was and everything was a mystery. And then sitting on the train listening to the announcements, and that was all a mystery too. And then now and again I'd hear a word, mamanaku, 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 what's that? And I'd look it up. Um, the other thing I was doing is um, I noticed that, because this person that triggered this video said about the, the characters, learning the characters, because, you know, there's 48 hiragana and 48 katakana and uh, thousands of kanji, right? And how do you go about doing that, you know? And so what I did was I noticed that a lot of the signs and a lot of the menus had a lot of katakana on them. And so my choice was to learn katakana first. So I used to sit on the train and 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 with the, with the little katakana in the back of my little notebook and, and I'd see the signs up on the train, the advertising signs, the katakana, and I'd read it and I'd look down and read it and I'd look up what the, the meaning was. And I, at that stage, I used to take notes. When I learnt new words, I used to write down the word and the meaning, and which is which I thought was a good idea. And I know that does work for some people too, having seen the word written down, it helps them remember it. Um, but my friend that, that learnt Chinese and learnt linguistics properly at the university, he told me, uh, it's a waste of time doing that. He said to me, just make examples. So when you find out a word, uh, a new word, you want to remember it, put it in a sentence, make three sentences with it, and that'll help you to remember it. Um, the other thing is, I've been um, surrounded by only Japanese, basically. I know I know my, my friend in Toyota um, basically was surrounded by English. He, he, he taught in English schools where the, the rule was only English, they weren't allowed to speak Japanese. He had English-speaking girlfriend, um, he just surrounded himself with, with himself with English-speaking people, and as a result of that, his Japanese only progressed very slowly to to, to not a very high level. He he would tell you. Um, whereas in my case, I just I, was, I went to the dojo and everybody just spoke Japanese. And I've got to tell you too, those of you who experienced whatever your native language is and whatever other language you've experienced. It's something really amazing to sit at a table of people. I used to sit in a kudo dojo, very formally on the tatami mat around a table, which was actually really good because from those guys, I learned a lot of Japanese culture as far as etiquette and things like that. But to be sitting at a table where you don't understand what anybody's saying and, and you feel really isolated and then, you know what makes you feel isolated the most is someone would make a joke and everybody would laugh and because you don't understand the joke, you're just sitting there. And and that one, th those are those moments where you feel really isolated, where you feel really, really, you know, you're sitting in this group of people, but you've got no idea what's going on. And yeah, it's pretty isolating. It is, it is pretty isolating, you know, and, and that's what it was like. That's what it was like. And then just over time, just for being in it, you know, and, and you learn the stuff, you learn the stuff that's most important to you first. You know, um, you learn the you, you learn what they're asking you when you go to the shop, when you go to the convenience store. What they're asking you: Do you want a bag? You know, do you want a bag for this? And you learn the answer to that, and and you learn the the the, the absolute basic essentials are the things you have to learn first. You know, and the polite pleasantries and manners, polite things you say to people when you talk to people, and all that sort of thing. You know, and then just just from being in it just from being in it and I, it depends on which route you take you know I was busy <laughs> I went out I'll finish the I learnt I learnt the katakana and I started to learn hiragana and I just got busy right when I first came here I had a bit of time but I soon got busy working right and just just never got back to it because I got busy working and then I got busy busy with all sorts of stuff going on and then you know I got married and I had kids and 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 I got about halfway through the hiragana and then 
just never finished learning it. And the, the kanji, I learnt the essentials. I learnt the essentials, you know, you need to know entrance and exit. If you're driving a car, you'd better know entrance and exit. Um, and just the basics like that, you know, and then picked up more and more kanji. Just, to, again, the essential ones that you need to know, you know, or the ones that you see all the time. And then you just pick them up. Um, and then, you know, I had to do an aviation uh, radio license test. Some of you might have seen a video about that a long time ago. And so I had to learn all sorts of kanji related to a, uh, aviation and radio and technical stuff. And, and just so, basically, I've, I've learned what I needed to learn, right? And as a result of that, my Japanese grammar is probably abysmal. Um, I always imagine in Australia, you often meet these people that are first generation Australians that, that you know, moved there when they were 20 years old or something. And now they're 60 years old, but their English is still really bad. You know, the, the grammar, there was a, an excellent guy that used to run the shop near where I lived in Australia. And he was a Greek guy. And hey, Miss Abus, how are you going? And, and, and really, really dodgy grammar. And, uh, and uh, it's still a really strong Greek accent and Greek pronunciation, you know, and, and, and uh, I think that's, that'd be me. I'm sure that's what I'm like, that, that when I speak, um, you know, my grammar is really abysmal. And, uh, and my vocabulary is limited too, you know. Quite often I'll get into a sub and talking to someone about something difficult and, and, and words come up all the time that I don't know the meaning to. Um, the way I get around that is, if they, someone says something to me and I don't know that word, I'll ask them, what does that mean? And they'll, they'll, often they'll say the same word again, and I'll say, I don't know what that word, what, what does it mean? And then usually what they'll do is they'll try another word, or another couple of words, to explain the same thing, and I'll get it. And the same thing for me, if, if I don't know the word I'm trying to remember, to say something to somebody, I just use an alternative word. And I think the point with this is, with this style of, I don't know, survival, language it's not you know i never did is it the jlpt or whatever it is the japanese language proficiency test you know and and you know i know some people are really into that and they use that as a motivator to get themselves to the next level in their japanese you know and i've never done any of those tests you know but but the way i see it is my my early tests were going to the convenience store and telling the staff if i wanted a bag or not um, and then as time progressed my my um, my tests were buying a house, sitting at a table with the with the, the um, real estate people and the bank and, and everybody else and 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 going through the paperwork to buy a house. That was a test. And going through the wedding, organising a wedding, and going through having kids in the hospital and and just every day is a test. Every time I leave the house and end up talking to somebody or going somewhere or trying to achieve something. Every time I try and achieve something, that's the test. You know, go to the hardware shop, doing some renovations at the old farmhouse, and need to go to the go to the home center and buy something. Every time I do that, that's a test. You know, going through the paint, trying to find the right color, and and you know they've got all the color written in kanji, and um, you know they're the tests. Or 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 I need to ask questions to people at the home center, and that's a test. And then listening to their answer, that's a test. So it's sort of. This style of Japanese is sort of survival Japanese, you know, it's, it's, it's you're learning the stuff you need to learn to get by, um, as opposed to how the, the motivations that some other people have or the, the, the systems that the other people, some other people have to, to learn it, you know. So um, it's a hard way to do it. And I think too, something I've noticed, I tend to notice it more with, with, with other people than myself and, and and that's the people's natural communication ability and and what you get something you see here all the time is I'll have some people I speak to now actually our real estate guy was like this I think I might have mentioned it to, to, to you guys in another video but our real estate guy excellent guy I totally trust him um, he, he helped us buy the house and uh, and then when I needed tradesmen, I did most of the work myself, but I needed a couple of things. I need an electrician, um, a couple of other things like that. And he helped organize it. But he's one of, the, he's one of these people that you, you come across here. And, and some of you guys living in other countries with other languages might experience this too. Every time I speak to him, well, not every time, but often when I speak to him, he just looks at me with this blank expression where he doesn't expect to understand what I'm saying to him right and we'd have these weird situations happen i remember one day the electrician was there 
and he and I had this big conversation, the electrician and I, about what I wanted him to do in the kitchen. I wanted him to hide the damn cables, that's what I wanted him to do. So we had this big, big, big conversation, I was explaining to him, look, I want all the cables hidden in the wall, you know, I don't like this stringing cables along the wall thing, and, and, and I'd explain to him how I wanted it done. And he understood, and it was all good. And then this guy turned up, who's actually a registered builder, as well as being a real estate guy, and he's turned up in the middle of the conversation, and I'm, I'm trying to explain it to him, and he's just looking at me with this blank expression, and the electrician is telling him what I'd said. And the difference between the two, I mean, neither of them could speak English, everything was Japanese, right? And again, this is another test for me, wasn't it? You know, having this big conversation about wiring a house. But, but the point is, I was saying the same things to both of those guys, and the electrician understood everything first time with no confusion at all, and the real estate guy's looking at me with this sort of blank expression. And the difference is people's natural communication ability, right? And I think this is a key too, and I, I've, I see it probably because I'm on the other side of the fence more, so I see it when I'm talking to Japanese people more. Um, but I assume it's the same for us, that some people just have a naturally good communication ability. And I meet people like that here all the time, where it's easy for me to communicate with them. You know, because they're just because they they're good listeners and <clears throat> they're paying attention and they're just naturally good communicators. So it's easy for me to make myself understood to them, <clears throat> and it's easy for me to understand them, right? And then you'll get another one, and you just sometimes I just know as soon as I say something to a person, and you get this sort of a blank expression where they sort of look look at you blankly, like they they're not expecting to understand what you say, and then they start to look around right like in, in like a bank or a post office or something like that they'll start to look around for someone else to help them or to help me or or something you know and and we've had it before with my wife where we'll be somewhere and there'll be something like looking at a new air conditioner or something or something technical and I understand that particular topic and she doesn't and I'll say something and ask a question and they'll look at her and answer to her and and that real estate guy used to do that too and I have to say hey look at me <laughs> Tell me, look at me, look at me, listen to me, right? So my point is, well, well one point is, if you come here and try and speak Japanese, you, you're probably going to experience that. Don't let, it, don't let it make you feel bad. The other point is, I think this is a big point for us when we learn Japanese. I think some people, you know, my friend in Toyota, who I love deeply, you know, wonderful guy, um, is not the best communicator in the world in any language. It's just not one of his tools, it's not one of his natural skills. And I think as a result of that, he does struggle. And and so that, that's definitely one thing, a person's natural communication ability. Another one is confidence. Another one is confidence, and it's a really big one. Um, it's really, you know, it doesn't matter what you've learned or how long you've been here or anything else, your confidence is really important. And I think that's my buddy struggles a bit with that. He, he doesn't have a lot of confidence, so everything he does, he tends to take his partner along to translate um, because he doesn't have a lot of confidence. Whereas, whereas I've done the things that I've needed to do pretty much by myself. I mean, sometimes my wife comes along with me, depending on what, like the wedding organization. She was the boss in that situation. I just tagged along, you know. Um, but I was involved in the, in the choices and the decision making and that sort of stuff as well. Um, but usually I do it myself and so my point is confidence is a big thing you've just got to try it you've just got to try it you know it doesn't matter whether you've learned it at university or whether you've learned it from a dictionary or learn it from watching anime or whatever else you've learned it from um, you've just got to try it you just got to put yourself out there you know my martial arts teacher from Australia the second time I came to Japan and I still couldn't speak Japanese at all and um, I was hanging out with my Toyota buddy all the time and the second time I came my, my teacher in Japan said to me go to Hiezan, so Mount Hiei in uh, Kyoto and go to Furo Myo, uh, go to um, uh, Myodo which is the um, temple in the mountains in the, in, on Mount Hiei for the Tendai Shu Buddhist so in other words this very um, difficult to get to isolated place where nobody, there's no English at all, right? And he sent me off to that, this place. And my first thought was, okay, I'll get my buddy to come with me. And he said, go on your own. And it was terrible, right? It was really, really, really tough. But 
I did it. And, and it's really important. I think this is another important point too. If you're on your own in Japan, you will learn more. If you're traveling with another buddy that speaks the same language as you, you'll tend to talk to each other all the time and you'll miss a lot. If it's just you sitting on the train, you'll hear everything. You won't understand it all, but you'll hear it all. And then bit by bit, I think this is another thing that really helped me. The first couple of years I was here, I was on my own. And, and I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing to have time here on your own. You, you're more observant, you see more, you hear more. You know, you, you absorb more and you learn more and it, it's good. It's good. A phone zombie there in front of us in the car in front. But, um, yeah, so so that's, that's a big point as well. So it, it just depends, you know. So that's my experience. Survival, survival Japanese, shall we call it. You know, just learning the Japanese I, I've needed. And I'm still doing it. You know, if, if there's something that I've got to do at the house and I need to get a starter for the for the fluoro light or something, hey, what do you, how do you say starter, you know? And, and quite often, what, what you do find happens is I haven't carried that dictionary I used to carry around everywhere, you know, and, and I don't need that anymore because what you do is you use the words that you know. And so if the, the, I need to know the word for the starter for the fluoro light, um, I just go into the, heart, the home center, uh, I'm trying to find, excuse me, you know, the light, you know, the little thing that you need to start the, the light, you know, the little thing. And they go, oh yeah, and they say what it is, which I can't remember. It's probably starta for all I know. But it just is an example, you know, you can use simpler words to explain more complex things. And if you can do that, then you don't need a dictionary. You know, you just, you just use the simple, there's another phone zombie in the white van. They're everywhere, I tell you. But yeah, if you, if, you, if you can do that, if you can just use the simpler words to accomplish more difficult things, um, you're there, basically. That's basically it. Um, and it's your communication ability. I mean, there's probably some conversations I have, talking about buying the house, settling on the house. They actually read the contract to you. Some of you might have seen that video. They actually read the contract to you. They sit there and, and turn over each page and explain every detail on, on every page. And of course, if I said I didn't understand any of it, everything would stop, wouldn't it? So you, you just have to understand what's important and then the other things just let them slide. And I knew what was important in that contract. So I made sure I understood those parts. And then all the other irrelevant stuff, because what was happening is they'd read a whole page and they get to the bottom of the page and they go, but that's not relevant to you, <laughs> right? So, you know, again, survival Japanese, you just need to learn what's important for you to get by. So this is one way to do it, right? Um, before I forget, one of the resources we've been, we've been um, um, advocating for years is Japanese Pod 101. I'll put a link underneath this video. We actually have an aff in their affiliate program. We've been recommending them for years and lots of people that watch our videos have been using them and are really happy. It helps you improve your Japanese. So highly recommend Japanese Pod 101. I'll put a link underneath the video. But other than that, it just depends what you're coming here for. You know, if you can study at university or study in your own country and get all prepared and do, do those JLPT tests and you know, you can read and write and speak and your grammar's much better than mine and everything else, then that's a great thing to do. Um, learn from a native speaker would be my advice and made a video about that years ago. There was a really good quality video made on YouTube years and years ago, this guy, American guy, teaching, teaching how to speak Japanese and it was really well produced. It was a really good video. But, but, it, but he said, okay, itch, ni, san, shi, right? <laughs> it's like, ah, okay. So yeah, learn, learn Japanese. That's why you've never heard me trying to teach any Japanese to anybody, because the last thing you want to do is learn from an Australian. Ich ne san she, right? So, um, that'd be it. That'd be it. Japanese Pod 101, try that. The, on that learning Japanese playlist, there are some other resources on there. Um, we did a while ago. Uh, it's not really our specialty though. Teaching Japanese is not our specialty, but if we do find resources that are useful, we put them on that playlist. So, so that was one person's experience, survival Japanese. So uh, it's worked. I, I pass the tests that I have to pass every day. I mean, that's just, that's, that's what survival Japanese is. Every time I do, I'm about to go in the convenience store and pay a couple of bills. That'll be another little test. Every time I do something here, it's another test, you know? So I had to buy a suit. It's a suit shop over there. Not where I bought my suit, but I did have to buy a suit because when you go to weddings and funerals here, you've got to wear a black suit. Had to buy a suit, had to get it fitted, 
whole heaps of words in there. I didn't know the word for crotch. I've forgotten it. But, but you know, every time you do something new like that, you get a whole bunch of new stuff that you don't know. So it's a um, constant learning experience, you know. Anyway, that's more than enough of that. So for years, 14 years or something, been making these videos, 16 years, people have been asking that question. There's your answer. <laughs> Next person who asks, I can just give them this video. There it was. More videos coming soon.